Okay, if uh, everybody would turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Um, over the next few days, what I want to what I want to do is over the next few days, what I want to do is, or next few meetings rather, what I want to do is uh, spend our time going over the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. Uh, so this will be more of a uh, word study through each verse as best as we can. Uh, Ephesians chapter one, verse one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Okay, so God, of course, is using the Apostle Paul uh, and moving him to write this epistle addressing the saints at Ephesus. The first thing we notice is Paul's apostleship. So we would ask, what exactly is an apostle? Uh, well, the word apostle is Strong's number G652. Uh, as we look up this number, we can see that the word apostle is also translated as messenger, uh, and it's also translated as he that is sent. Let's take a look at John 13, verse 16. And you want to keep your finger at Ephesians 1, because we're going to keep turning back and forth to it. John 13, 16. There we read, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that a servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent, and that's our, our word apostle, neither he that is sent, greater than he that sent him. So an apostle is someone who is sent. Uh, but just as there are true apostles of Christ, there are also false apostles that come in the name of Christ, but are actually messengers of Satan. Uh, so if you would turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, I'd like to take a look at that. 2 Corinthians 11, we'll read verses 13 to 15. Second Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is, of no, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The difference between a true apostle of Christ and a false apostle that comes in the name of Christ is who has done the work of transformation. Okay, if we recall back in Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul was made an apostle uh, of Christ by the will of God. But every false apostle, as we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, transformed themselves into the apostles of Christ. And this, of course, harmonizes with everything we know to be true about election unto salvation being solely by the will and work of God. Let's take a look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 12. We'll read verse 12 and 13. John chapter 1, verse 12. There we read. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, so that is, born again, not of blood. This means that your lineage or your bloodline plays no part in your salvation, nor of the will of the flesh, meaning that one's physical desire for salvation could never result in salvation, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, God is making it abundantly clear that salvation, which is what being born again is, never had anything to do with man's desire or will. Salvation was always through the will of God alone. Therefore, to be an apostle of Christ means that one has been sent by Jesus Christ to bear his name and perform his will. Okay, let's turn back to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So at first glance, it almost seems like Paul is addressing two groups of people here. Uh, it says, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. 
But of course, he's actually addressing the same group. Uh, the King James Bible has added a few additional words here. The verse should read this way. To the saints which are at Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Also, the word God uses here as saints helps us to know exactly who God is addressing or who God through Paul is addressing. Uh, he's addressing his people. The churches are not the ones being addressed here. Uh, it's God's people. Uh, the word saints is Strong's number G40. Uh, and here in the Bible, it's also translated as holy. So we can reread this verse this way. To the holy which are at Ephesus. And this word holy is a word that God uses to describe the elect and himself. Uh, let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll read verse 15 and 16. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. There we read. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Okay, now the word faithful, found in Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, also helps us to confirm who is being addressed in this passage. The word faithful is Strong's number 4103. It's also translated as believing and also as true. And just as this word is used by God to describe his elect, uh, this word is also used by him to describe himself. Let's take a look at that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians 1, we'll read verse 18. Second Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.18, there we read, But as God is true, and the word true here is the word faithful, but as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. So in Ephesians 1, God through Paul is historically addressing those at Ephesus which were holy and true, but spiritually he's addressing the elect throughout the world because that's what the city of Ephesus represents. Uh, and that's what I want to take a look at. So let's take a look at the word Ephesus a little closer. Um, when we look at the word Ephesus, or the word Ephesians, uh, which is what those who live in Ephesus are called, we see that the word Ephesus is Strong's number 2181, and the word Ephesians is Strong's number 2180. So for all intents and purposes, we're looking at the same word. When we look up these words, we learn that the city of Ephesus was predominantly a city, or they were predominantly a worshiper uh, of many false gods. And as we know, Paul in his letter is addressing the saints which are at Ephesus. But Ephesus, like every other nation, including Israel, were predominantly inhabited by unsaved people. Uh, and they had few living within it that were actually saved. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 19. It talks quite a bit about the city of Ephesus. Acts chapter 19, we'll look at the first eight verses. Acts 19, verses 1 through 8. There we read. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, all having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. And they, that sp and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly in for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Okay, let's jump down to verse 21, and we'll continue on from there. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit, uh, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for, for a season. At the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. 
For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but also throughout all of Asia, this Paul persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So up to this point, we learned that the city of Ephesus was a city in Asia. Let's continue. So that not only this craft, this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed in with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were friends, sent unto him, desiring that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another. So the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with the hand, and he would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana, and the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. So what we learn here is that the city of Ephesus, like every other nation, is a worshiper of false gods. And interesting that in verse 27, we read that not only the city of Ephesus, which was a city in Asia, was worshiping false gods, but also all of Asia was included. And not, not only was all of Asia included, but the world itself. Okay? In other words, God is using Ephesus, which was a heathen nation, to typify the world itself. Therefore, when God is addressing the saints at Ephesus, it can be understood that God is spiritually addressing the saints throughout the world. Okay, let's continue with Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2, we read, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 2 is continuing the greeting um, of those being addressed, of the elect. And it's only unto the elect that grace has been bestowed. The word grace is Strong's number G5485, and this word is also translated as favor. In other words, to have the grace of God bestowed upon you is to have the favor of God. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 1, verse 26. We'll read up to verse 30. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26, there we read. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor, or grace, with God. By this language, we can be sure that Mary was an elect child of God. Uh, and she found grace, just as every, every elect of God finds grace, and is highly favored of God. But what exactly does it mean to be highly favored? Well, the word highly favored is Strong's number 5487, and it only appears one other time. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Let's take a look at that. It appears one other time in Ephesians 1, 6 as made accepted. 
In Ephesians 1, chapter 6, we read, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. So to be highly favored is to be made accepted. And to have found favor is to have found grace, neither of which we had anything to do with. Uh, let's continue with Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to spend some time looking at this word peace uh, so we can better understand that this greeting is not intended to only give the illusion of a simple greeting. But there's a lot more here that God wants us to understand. The word peace is Strong's number G1 or G1515. And in Luke 10:6, we find this word used twice. Uh, once to describe Christ as the Son of Peace, and another, again, Christ describes himself within his elect. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 6. There we read, And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. So I think it's important to understand that the letter to the Ephesians was a letter to those who historically did not identify with the physical nation of Israel, but they were Gentiles. Uh, therefore, the greeting of grace and peace, uh, as we read in Ephesians 1-2, is a desire for salvation to those who before time did not outwardly identify with the people of God, uh, but they were elect nonetheless. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2 for a minute. Ephesians 2, verse, we're going to read verses 11 through 19. Ephesians 2, 11 to 19, there we read, Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time ye were without Christ, we could also understand this to say that at the time you were without the word of God. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off were made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. And this is the same word peace that we've been looking at. Who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Again, this is our word, peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were not. For through him we have both access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Before we cross, before the cross and in the period of the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, they were the stewards of the gospel and they were the outward representatives of the people of God. Uh, the rest of the nations of the world, as nations, for the most part, were alienated from this blessing. Uh, this means that God's word was being given to no other nation at the time, and the nation of Israel was the only nation which was recognized as the people of God. Okay, But at the time of the cross, and in 33 AD, Christ had done away with the nation of Israel as the stewards of the gospel and as the outward representatives of the people of God. So 33 AD marked the time where God's salvation plan would be officially and outwardly extended to include all the nations of the world, even though God was already saving Jews and Gentiles since the beginning. Uh, the word Gentiles means nations. It also means heathen. Uh, and that's what the Gentiles historically represented, uh, nations without God. Therefore, the greeting of grace and peace is a desire for salvation unto all those whom God has chosen uh, from the nations of the world. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8. I will read the first six verses. Romans chapter 8. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And here is our word, peace. So to have peace is to be made free from the law of sin and death. That's why we read in um, the first verse of Romans 8 that there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And so to have peace, uh, or to have the peace of God, is to be in Christ Jesus. Uh, another way we can look at the greeting of grace and peace is as a desire for someone who is already saved to continue to grow in grace uh, and in the Spirit and to continue to bear much fruit. Um, this is true because peace happens to be one of the fruit of the Spirit. Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 5. We'll read verses 16 to 25. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, verse 16, there we read, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, this is our word, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live, by the, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Okay, I also want to take a look at 2 Peter 3.18. Second Peter chapter three verse eighteen. There we read. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. So to have peace is to have salvation. But peace doesn't end there. Uh, it's also something that develops as spiritual fruit. And to find grace is to find the favor of God. But grace also doesn't end there. Grace is something that continues to develop within each child of God all the days of his life. Uh, I think it's also important to note that having peace uh, doesn't mean that we'll not have trouble in this world. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. Uh, the, the true child of God, even though he has the peace which comes from God, shall have, according to the Bible, much tribulation in this world. Let's take a look at that in Romans chapter 5. We'll read the first five verses. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Romans 5, verse 1. There we read. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein ye stand, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, 
and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Let's turn back to Second Peter also, chapter 3. 2 Peter 3, we'll read verses 13 and 14. 